Hello, I'm Alan Stanley. I'm one of the lay ministers in the Elmi Trinity Benefice. Welcome to this reflection for Friday the 20th of November. We're going to be looking at just three verses from Luke's Gospel today. That's from chapter 19 verses 45 to 48. But they are three verses packed with thoughts for us to get our heads round. So let's start with a prayer. Lord, open these three verses to our hearts. Let them wander around our thinking through the day so that they may gently shift the way we think and then the way we live, making us more like the Jesus who we read about in them. Amen. So these are the verses. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. All the other gospel writers give much more space than Luke to this incident in Jesus' life. I wonder why that is. Why does Luke keep his account so brief? Probably because he wants us to focus on the key phrase, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Rather than getting sidetracked about Jesus turning over tables and driving out the sacrificial animals, the things that figure in the other versions. Luke takes us on an unfolding story of the relevance of the temple in his two-volume work, Luke and Acts. At first, in the Nativity story, the temple is a place of prayer and worship. It's there that the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and tells him that, in their great old age, he and Elizabeth, his wife, will have a son, John, later to be known as John the Baptist. Here, in Luke 19, we see how corrupt the temple had become. It is now a place where merchants, with the collusion of the temple clergy, set so many obstructions in the way of genuine worshippers, so they just couldn't get to worship God without lining the pockets of the merchants. Those who rob the genuine worshippers of their cash, and with it, their ability to worship freely. Then, in his second volume, Acts, Luke records firstly Stephen's speech labelling the temple as an irrelevance after Jesus' death and resurrection. And secondly, when Paul is dragged from the temple by the Roman authorities and the gates are firmly shut behind him, a little further on in Acts, the temple turns into something directly opposed to the worship of God. The temple's gone from being a help to worship through being a barrier to worship, which you could only cross if you had the right entry requirements, in this case cash, to being in total opposition to genuine worship. Okay, so what we've done so far is to prepare our reflecting surface. We have, if you like, polished the incident so that we can see ourselves more clearly in it. So. Now it is time to take a look at ourselves through that incident in Jesus' life. What do you see? A religious institution, a system which has lost its way. That is certainly there. History shows us loads of times when the Christian church has lost its way, has in fact, just like those temple authorities, put up barriers to people coming to worship God. The trappings of power and privilege are never far away from the life of the Church of England, the established church, the church with its rigid hierarchical structures, its laws which prevent you and me from breaking bread and drinking wine in our homes to remember Jesus if we don't have someone who is called a priest living with us. Well I could go on and, and to be fair I often do. But the important thing is not what I think. But how many ways can you think of in which the Church of England gives the impression of putting obstacles in the way of people coming to God? Could it be its pretentious titles? Priest, Venerable, Lord Bishop, Most Reverend and Right Honourable. 
Could it be impenetrable structures, benefice, episcopal area, electoral roll, annual parochial church meeting? But of course, I am being mischievous, I know that. The real questions are about me, not the Church of England. What are the ways in which I may, however inadvertently, get in the way of people coming to God? Does my life match up to my words? Or, more, much, 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 much more importantly, does my life match up to the God who is mostly known for his generosity, his grace and forgiveness, his welcome and acceptance, his unconditional love? Does my life match up to that God? Those are the big questions that this passage brings us face to face with. One final thought as we look at ourselves reflected in this incident in Jesus' life. We have understood that the purpose of having the temple at all was that it should be a place of encounter between God and people, a house of prayer. I'm sure you get that prayer here is not a list of requests or a set form of words, but a real encounter with God himself. But Luke, when he quotes Isaiah's saying, misses off the end bit. Isaiah actually wrote, My house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. I wonder why Luke misses that bit off. Most likely because by the time Luke wrote his gospel, the temple had all but been destroyed anyway. So it was an irrelevance to everyone, whether they were a Jew or a Gentile. Here's a question. Do you think the Christian church today has become an irrelevance to most people? If you do, how can it be turned round? And maybe the final important question, what is your part in that turning around? I'd love to have your thoughts on that. My emails uh, on the screen or you can ring me at the number on the screen. You really do not need to agree with everything I've said, and in fact, in many ways, I hope you will disagree with a lot of what I've said. But if listening to this reflection had made you question these three verses, then you would have not have wasted your time in listening. A final prayer from a New Zealand prayer book. God of the living word, Give us the faith to receive your message, the wisdom to know what it means, and the courage to put it into practice. Amen.